Uh, hello everyone, I'm Peter Jacob, uh, a curator for the Early Flight Collection, and today we're going to talk about uh, one of our uh, Primo Early Flight aircrafts, the Wright EX VinFizz, which is right above us. So why don't we just scoot up the escalator and we'll meet directly above. Okay, here we are in uh, our wonderful new space, Pioneers of Flight Gallery. And you might notice, particularly those of you who have been around the museum a bit, that the Wright EX VinFizz is in a new location. It used to be back in the corner gallery. And I'm excited that now it's kind of out here in the, in the, in the main drag uh, because it's really uh, one of the uh, key milestone artifacts that we have in, in the early collection. I think most of you know we have the original 1903 Wright Flyer next door in the, in the Wright Gallery. And we have downstairs the Wright Military Flyer, the world's first military airplane, two of the, the most important airplanes in, in aviation history. But our third Wright Brothers airplane, uh, the Vin Fizz, represents uh, an interesting uh, kind of third component to the story. We've got the Wright uh, 03 airplane, which is the, the seminal experimental aircraft in, in the Wright brothers' work. That's the first airplane to fly, the, the proof of concept machine of all the, the technological innovations that they developed to create uh, successful mechanical flight. And we have uh, the Wright military flyer, which represents the design, uh, the perfecting of the Wright Brothers design, where they introduced the airplane to the world, they began to sell their airplanes to the world, and really uh, created practical aviation. And then the Wright EX Min Fizz really kind of represents the beginnings of corporate aviation, or, or the business of aviation. Uh, the Wright Brothers uh, began their manufacturing company in late 1909, began manufacturing airplanes for sale in 1910, and they began with an airplane they called the Wright Model B. And the Wright Model B was the first airplane that the Wright brothers built that had wheels for landing gear rather than the skids, was the first airplane that had the horizontal stabilizer in the rear in a more uh, modern conventional sense than in the front where they typically had. So the Model B kind of represented their uh, uh, first airplane they manufactured and some important uh, uh, design elements for, for practical use. And the, the Wright EX here, the Wright Vin Fizz, was a smaller experimental uh, uh, exhibition version of the Model B. So we really have, in our Wright Brothers aircraft collection, representation of the beginnings of their experimental work, the uh, perfection of their design and the sort of introduction of the airplane to the world, and then the beginnings of the aviation as business with, with the Wright EX. The other distinctive feature, of course, about uh, the Vin Fizz is the uh, interesting Vin Fizz logo, the, the, the grapes and the, the, uh, the ideal uh, grape drink uh, logo. Uh, this is the first airplane that had any uh, uh, use with commercial advertising. Uh, uh, Cal Rogers, the pilot of this airplane, uh, uh, flew the airplane across the United States for the first time, and it was sponsored by uh, the armor company, uh, the probably better known for uh, their meat products than their uh, soft drinks, uh, but they were manufacturing a, a great flavor soft drink in that period, and they were the sponsor of the flight and had their uh, logo emblazoned on the airplane. So uh, the Vin Fizz, in interesting ways, uh, represents uh, the beginnings of, of aviation as business. Uh, the personality associated with the Vin Fizz, uh, Calbraith Perry Rogers, or Cal Rogers as he was uh, typically known, uh, was an interesting figure, uh, kind of a, a, a big strapping guy, uh, cigar chomping guy, quite a, a personality. But he actually had uh, an important uh, family lineage. He was uh, a descendant of um, uh, important figures in uh, U.S. naval history. Uh, 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 he was uh, uh, also interested in uh, pursuing a naval career himself. But because of a bout with scarlet fever as a child, he had lost hearing in, his, uh, in one of his ears and was unable to qualify for military service. Uh, but his cousin, John Rogers, was one of the first uh, naval aviators. Uh, he was actually the second uh, uh, naval aviator, the, the second person to be uh, qualified for uh, flying with the Navy. And when John Rogers went to get his training at the Wright Brothers factory in the Wright Brothers School in Dayton, Ohio, uh, Cal uh, visited him there and got interested in flight and began to take flying lessons himself. And in 1911, uh, got his flying license. A couple weeks after that, he participated in a flying uh, competition in Chicago and won $11,000 in prize money with various events. And $11,000 in 1911 was uh, a lot of schmeezes. And uh, he was uh, instantly uh, famous as one of the uh, uh, premier uh, early aviators. Just at this time, uh, the famous publishing magnate William Randolph Hearst 
uh, put out a challenge for the first person to fly an airplane across the United States in 30 days or less. It was a $50,000 prize. Again, nice, nice hefty prize. Uh, some of the more uh, prominent aviators of the day, like the Wright brothers and Glenn Curtis, uh, contemplated uh, trying for the prize, but they uh, felt that the technology really wasn't there yet to accomplish this task uh, with any degree of safety or uh, reliability and, and chose not to go for the prize. Cal Rogers uh, decided it was worth a try and uh, 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 purchased this airplane um, himself uh, from the right, uh, the right company, and then the uh, rest of the flight was sponsored by the, uh, the armor company. Uh, Cal got $5 for every mile east of the Mississippi that he successfully traveled and $4 for every mile west of the Mississippi. I guess there were fewer customers to see the Vinfizz logo west of the Mississippi, so a lower rate. Uh, again, all the beginnings of commercial uh, aviation uh, at present in this airplane. Uh, Cal uh, took off from New York, Sheepshead Bay, New York, uh, on September 17th, uh, 1911. And uh, 49 days later, and numerous crashes uh, later, uh, he arrived in Pasadena, California. Uh, although he didn't uh, get past Kansas City before the 30 days ran out, so um, he didn't get the $50,000 prize, but he wanted to complete the flight, so he, he, he kept on going. Uh, he uh, made it to uh, Pasadena, which was the official uh, 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 termination point of the flight, but he wanted to literally fly coast to coast, so he then flew from Pasadena uh, to Long Beach, California, and rolled the airplane into the surf and had this famous photograph taken of the, the waves lapping over the landing gear of the airplane. So he literally wanted to fly coast to coast, and he did it in this airplane. So it becomes the, the world's first uh, transcontinental, or the United States' first transcontinental flight. But from a... Uh, that's the basic history of the, of the airplane, but from a curatorial point of view and from an artifact point of view, this, this object has an interesting story. There is documentation that the Vin Fizz was returned to the Wright Brothers factory in 1916 and uh, was destroyed. There is documentation that the uh, Wright EX was uh, continued to be flown by uh, uh, John Rogers, again, uh, the uh, Cal Rogers' cousin, and that it was crashed and destroyed. There is evidence that the airplane was inherited by Roger's uh, uh, wife and, and then her uh, husband after uh, Cal was killed. Cal was killed shortly after the, the 1911 flight in, in, a, in a different airplane. Um, so how could it be that all of these stories are true? And the answer is the airplane, uh, as I say, flew from uh, New York to California with many stops and many crashes and was rebuilt many, many times during the course of the flight. And in fact, the armor company sponsored a train that would follow uh, Cal across the United States, again with the VinFizz logo on it. And that train had numerous uh, parts and wing panels and engine components and uh, all sorts of things. It even had a, an automobile on board, so if uh, the airplane went down some distance from the rail line, they could drive the car and go, go get Cal and go get, go get the airplane. Uh, so there was this support uh, uh, entourage that followed him across the country. The airplane was rebuilt so many times that by the time it got to California, they had gone through about 18 wing panels. They had replaced uh, the landing gear numerous times. Uh, engine was repaired. In fact, there was one point where he was flying where the engine blew up and uh, there were some metal shards from one of the cylinders that embedded in Cal's arm. I mean, it was quite a, uh, an arduous trip. So by the time the airplane actually got to California and the Pacific Ocean was lapping over its wheels for the famous photograph, there was almost nothing that was on the airplane when it took off in New York. It had been replaced all these times. All these times. So how could we have had the airplane destroyed, crashed, and survived, and that still be the real Vin Fizz? The answer is there were so many flown original Vin Fizz parts by the time the flight ended that you had enough for several original Vin Fizz aircraft. So what we have here is the Vin Fizz that is made up from original Vin Fizz Vin Fizz flown parts, so that is the real Vin Fizz, because so oftentimes people say, oh, well, that's a reproduction that's in the Smithsonian because, you know, the real one was crashed or the real one was destroyed, or that's not the real airplane because everything that was uh, on it in New York wasn't on it when it landed in California. Well, 
it's the original airplane that landed in California. Just because the parts weren't on it from New York doesn't mean that those are not original parts. So what we have here is an original, real Wright Brothers airplane made up of infin, flown VINFIS parts. So that's, that's the interesting kind of curatorial side to this artifact, that it's, it's the real airplane, but it's the real airplane that was destroyed twice before. <laughs> Uh, this airplane also uh, was uh, part of the uh, Smithsonian sesquicentennial anniversary exhibition that traveled around the United States in 1996. And at that time, uh, because we were assembling it and disassembling it many times, uh, we decided not to have the original engine on it anymore. Uh, and we fabricated a wooden dummy engine on there. And what's on there now is a fake wooden engine. It looks really really terrific. It's hard to tell, certainly from this vantage point, that it's not a real engine. Uh, but we did that uh, as a conservation measure uh, on the airplane because we were having to take off this heavy uh, original engine every time we took apart the airplane. And when we reinstalled the airplane here, we decided to leave the reproduction engine on it because the real engine that was on it was not original to the Vin Fizz. It was a, a, another Wright Brothers engine that was added to the airplane later. So we weren't taking anything away from the original artifact. So an interesting kind of curatorial story to this object and that kind of old philosophy about, you know, is the axe handle original if the handle's been changed 10 times and the blade's been changed 10 times, is it still the original axle, uh, axe? And in the case of the Vin Fizz, uh, a little bit of that kind of story that it's been uh, recreated numerous times but recreated with original parts. So uh, in my mind, it's, it's the real airplane. So uh, that's the thumbnail sketch of the Vin Fizz. Why we have it, um, as part of the new Pioneers Gallery. Uh, we have uh, rededicated the focus of the, the Pioneers Gallery to be the 1920s and 1930s. So we have artifacts in here that focus on military aviation, civilian aviation, and the early history of rocketry from that period. But what's an interesting thing about the Vin Fizz, it really foreshadows so many of the things that we're featuring here in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, pioneering long distance flights, larger than life personalities like Jimmy Doolittle and Amelia Earhart, uh, 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 technology innovations with the rocketry, uh, the around the world flight with the, the Douglas World Cruiser here. With the Vin Fizz, you had uh, a, a, a larger than life personality, a, a famous individual associated with the, with the aircraft. You had uh, uh, the development of aviation as a business with the commercial uh, component of the Vin Fizz. We had uh, uh, pioneering long distance flights with the first transcontinental flight. The, uh, the, the, the T2 up here is the first non-stop uh, transcontinental flight in, in 1923, uh, uh, replicating what the, the Vin Fizz did, but only with one stop. Uh, so the, the Vin Fizz in many ways kind of foreshadows uh, aviation in the 1920s and 30s. And the, I always like to use the metaphor when we talk about the Wright brothers and, and the early history of flight, that's kind of the birth of aviation. When we look at this period in the 1920s and 1930s, that's kind of the adolescence of aviation. And then when we look at World War II and, and later, we see the maturation and kind of the adulthood of aviation. And uh, now we're starting to get into the grandfather of put of aviation, I guess, with B-52s that have been around for 60 years and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, so the Vin Fizz presents a, a, a nice kind of transition from the Wright Brothers Gallery and the birth of flight and kind of a foreshadowing uh, representation in this object of the kinds of themes that we're talking about here in uh, Pioneers of Flight. So that's the reason why we moved it out here. And I think it, it presents a nice kind of a grabber artifact to kind of draw people into the, into the new gallery. So a little bit about the history of that and history of it as an artifact and, and what its role is now for us in terms of the program. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.